Thank you very much. Well, uh, it's been a while, and hopefully <coughs> I'll stay awake till the end of the service because guys my age, some of us are already in bed, okay? But having said that, um, relationships, say relationships. Two greatest commands in Scripture. Love God with all of your heart. We're made in His image. You're made to look like the Lord. You look like exactly how the Lord wants you to look like. So when you wake up in the mirror tomorrow morning, you go, I love you. Because God made you. God made you. Whether you got scotch tape for the double eyelids or you got whatever you do, okay, God loves you just the way you are. But the second greatest commandment is that you love your neighbor or those whom, good, whom God puts around you. And Scripture says all of the commands are summarized in that second greatest commandment, that we love others as we love ourselves. The reason I'm talking to you about this and introducing this to you this, this evening is because I'm going to talk to you about relationships, specifically forgiveness, trust, and reconciliation. And I hope not to bore you. I hope to, to, to take this through quickly because we talked to the morning services about this. And so I want to be able to talk to you uh, at your level about this, all right? Uh, how many have been to the new international marketplace? Okay, because they said it's like almost half and half, half tourists, half locals, all right? Now, the guy who built that out and led the drive for that's in our church. And, and long story short, Todd Crossan uh, was, when he was a little older than you, very successful, rich, had all the money and the women he wanted. There was, he was in an explosion and it blew him 300 feet in the air. He lived. He was burned over half his body, melted his nose and ears down. The Lord healed him. And he's, my, he's going to team up with me next week. He's going to team up with Pastor Billy next week. All right? So he's a miracle man. And he died and came back. He prayed that he would die. And he was dead. And he was on his way to heaven. But the church was praying so hard for him, he made a U-turn on the way to heaven, and he saw himself, true story, this is not Iron Man fiction, it was, he got back in his body, and he was angry at God because the recovery was a year and a half in the hospital. You know, when you're a burn victim, and a third degree burn, burn victim over half your body, there's nothing more painful to recover from than that. So... But we're not going to talk about that. I'm just saying, if you've been to the international marketplace, the guy who built it's in our church. Now, two years are done. He's going to go back home to Dallas. All right? I played music in the international marketplace when I was in college. To kind of get myself through school, I played music there. And when I played music there, I looked exactly like how I look now. Okay, except I'm older, but I was just as skinny. And women wanted me. <laughs> this is true. There's a lot of desperate women. Wait, I'm not done. There's a lot of desperate men. There's a lot of desperate men out there. And the bad combination is when a desperate man and a desperate woman get together. Because it makes for an explosion. And it's usually not good. All right? So... Now, I say that because out of that music lifestyle, when I came to the Lord and I gave my life to the Lord, I found out there's desperate women in church. And it just kind of blew my mind. Now, I had to deal with desperate women out there because out there you have foxy-looking women that will go for ugly men like this. See all that shine on me right there? Yeah? You want some of this? See? They wanted all of this back in the world. I'm like, look, I'm not joking, okay? I, I did not grow up in church, all right? I grew up in the international marketplace, quite literally, playing music when I was too young, doing things I shouldn't be doing, having things done to me that should have been done to me. You follow me, okay? All right. <laughs> Wipe your dirty mind away just right now. Just get that out of the way. When I came to church, I realized church is a hospital. Church is where we come, we find Jesus, and Jesus heals us. But in the process, after I just graduated from high school, I was preparing myself for ministry, I was a minister in training, there was a woman who had the hots for me. 
and she was obsessed with me. And she was upset at the fact that I wasn't paying her any attention. To be, to be honest with you, I barely knew who she was. And we were in a ministry training environment together. She had a master's degree, and she ran part of a major hospital in Honolulu. So this was no weird, freaky person. But she was desperate, obviously for love. And somehow, she got fixated on me. And when I didn't give her attention, she drew up a list of 13 accusations called all of the elders, the 12 elders that were in the church. And I was called in because I was accused of things that you would call today as, you would call today sexual harassment, which back then in 1977, that there wasn't even the term. And let me tell you, that was a wake-up call for me because I knew I could either blow up or I could forgive her and let God deal with her and heal my soul. It was very difficult because this was a woman of respect. It's one thing if a Looney Tunes person accuses you. It's another thing if a responsible person accuses you. This was a frightening moment. I remember being on my face before the Lord. And I said, God, you got to help me. Because, you know, I grew up in Kalihi. And I said, I've I only been saved like, like five years. And right now, I want to I push her off a cliff. <laughs> this was my prayer time. For an hour before that meeting, I, I said, Lord, I just got everything out. You know, already know what's in my heart. You know I want to punch her. I want to push her off the cliff and have a dump truck run over her soul. You know all this, so I may as well tell you. This is, <laughs> folks, this is true. Okay, because these were serious, specific, dirty accusations from the pit of hell. And I remember sitting in there, and the, the meeting went about like 90 minutes. She, and she was reading through this list, and with each point, I went, Duh, what? Oh, you know, like the Hulk, man. You know, I could, inside of me, I f could feel myself. You know what I'm saying? But I knew what I needed to do. At the end of that, I remember the elders looked at her, and one person who was a real prophetic guy stood up. She said, and he said, you're lying. I went, yeah, she's lying. <laughs> really? I wanted to stand up. And, and this guy was big. Okay, he was huge. He was like 6'3", something. I wanted to go, yeah, he's, he's, she's lying. This other guy also had a word from the Lord and said, and he, he said, you have had issues with men in your past, with your father. And, and he began to just dial in prophet. She got up, got really angry, threw into a rage. I, even I went, whoa, woman, control yourself. <laughs> and she walked out to the, she slammed the door. I remember that. And I was like, and I remember the, the guys, you know, these like these elders, they all kind of looked at her to get, as she stomped out and left the building. And I looked at them, I and I said, well, now what? <laughs> now what? Well, I knew what was next. I needed to forgive her. And they looked at me, and they said, those are pretty stiff accusations, Norman, but we want you to know, we know those are not true. Okay, now today, if you heard that list, guess what? Most people would go, there's a bit of truth in that. Let me tell you what. I got to tell you. There was no truth in that. When people say, oh, well, in those accusations, there's always a germ of truth in that. No, not always. Sometimes it's purely the devil who gets a hold of her soul. And this woman, who was wonderful in every other way, responsible, had just one area in her life. She hadn't forgiven the men in her past. And so it got worse. Once the enemy gets a foothold in something, it gets worse. So... Here's where I want to start tonight. We need to forgive. Forgive unconditionally and immediately. Because if you don't forgive, you get like that. Something grows in you, and you will give off a toxicity and you're not even aware of. And pretty soon you start spouting lies that are not true. Look at what Jesus said. He said, no, this is the great apostle Paul, book of Colossians. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, which is self-control, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as, watch, how do you forgive? As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must 
forgive. The Apostle Paul says you must. Why is this? Forgiveness by its definition means to let go by a decision, not by a motion. That's what forgiveness is. And a lot of people think emotion is, forgiveness is, I will forgive the person if I feel like it. No, you don't feel your way into forgiveness. It will never happen. You have to decide to forgive. Jesus said, said it this way. He says, pay attention to yourself or your soul. See, this woman was actually a good woman, okay? That's why I was shocked. Everybody was shocked. But she had just this one area in her soul that the enemy the devil had got on a hold of. He says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. There's that imperative verb again. You must forgive him. So what Jesus is saying, there's going to be, there are going to come times when people close to you, because that's what it usually is, they offend you. You help them by confronting them in love. You confront them with the truth. And if they confess to you, he's saying, you forgive them. You forget, that's unconditionally. How Jesus forgave us was unconditionally. He didn't wait for us to clean ourselves up. The gospel, he went to the cross and provided forgiveness, cleansing, and redemption for all of us, right? So what we have here is you must forgive. But in the gospel of Matthew, he says, even if they don't repent, you forgive them anyway. And he says seven times, because in Jewish law, if you forgave a person three times, and they didn't change, you could exact retribution and it would be legal. Isn't that something? So when the disciples were asking him this, they were kind of, kind of baiting him. So, you know, what if seven times? Let's be noble here. And they were hoping Jesus would say, oh, you think, brother, you, then you can get them. You can get them. You call your brothers huh? and your brothers' brothers and your brothers' brothers' brothers and you get them. Just do it cleanly. All right? But Jesus is blowing that out of the water. He says, no. In fact, he says seven times, 70 times, seven times. The Gospel of Matthew, I believe, chapter 18. In other words, he says, make the decision as often as it takes to keep your soul clean of toxicity. The more you make the decision to forgive, whether you feel like it or not, you keep your relationship with God clean and with others clean. All right? Now, here's what we need to know. What I needed to do with this woman, I'll tell you the story, I needed to forgive her. Here's what forgiveness does. It releases my soul so God can heal it to be healthy. It puts the other person in the hands of God. Because the book of Romans says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Let me tell you what, nobody gets away with anything in life. How many of you have been wrong before and you've been wrong now? Whoever has violated you God will deal with. He won't even begin to deal with them, though, until you forgive them. Forgiveness is where we let go, and know this, when you let go of the offender, God will begin to deal with them. That has helped me so much. So when I say, I F you, I forgive you, right? That's the F word. You know, a lot of people don't want to forgive. For them, that's the, I'm never going to forgive them. I never, no. So in my mind, I mean, this is me, okay? I, I was born and raised in Kalihi. I had to, in my mind, go, I F you. But that kind of felt a little too good because you know what I'm saying? If you say I F you, that you could be thinking that's enough. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. After a while, I began to feel my heart was clean and, I, and the Lord dealt with her. After I got married to Faye, we were eating one of her, the first dinners ever in our Salt Lake apartment. She made cream tuna. What a delicacy when you have no money. <laughs> and, and there was a phone. I remember the night. We were eating cream tuna, but we, she made it a little better. She had some potato chips on the side. You put them in there, and you stick them in. It melts real good. <laughs> All right. When you pour, you think of things. And I, I answered the phone, and she said, um, you're not going to believe this, but it's so-and-so. I knew it. I, I just had this feeling. You know, I have this premonition. It was her. So, you know, of course, my wife, my wife goes, who that? Because <laughs> she can tell the body language, the face, and everything. Like, who that? I went. <laughs> eh? <laughs> not now. <laughs> Here's what she said. Four years ago, I lied, and I want to ask you to forgive me. 
it was wrong. I've been through counseling and therapy, but I went as low to be, as to be admitted to Kaneohe Mental Hospital. And there I realized when I hit bottom how I really needed to forgive and I couldn't. And you were one of those I took it out on. She, she said, will you forgive me? Of course. I said, of course I forgive you. I forgave you back then and I forgive you now. What a journey. But the learning from her is what a bad thing when you don't forgive. That's what Jesus teaches. You know why we forgive? We forgive for us to keep us healthy, to keep our soul from breaking. Because if you don't forgive, the relationships that you try to have with others, the unhealed hurt in you will be projected onto future friendships and relationships. So you forgive. You forgive for yourself. You let go. Uh, I'll give you an example. I'm going to stay here a little bit and, then, and we're going to move along. I'm discipling this guy now, and, and it's just great to see his family come to the Lord. And, but his wife works with a person who flirts with married men. And he said, it's driving her crazy. You know, she's a pretty new Christian, loves Jesus, and she has a place of favor. She's in administration, but she just... And finally, my friend told her the same thing. You got to forgive her, okay? She agitates you. She irritates you. She's at you. You have to let it go. Because it's just, you're losing. So finally, she said, you know what? You're right. There was a rash on the back of her neck. She couldn't sleep. All these things are happening. Who's losing when you don't forgive? Not them. You. She let go. Here's what happened. I just got the report two weeks ago. The rash got healed. That she tried everything to heal. And the person that was agitating her got transferred to a whole nother area of government and who took her place, they hired her best friend. How's that? I almost was like, that's too good to be true. The only thing better is if the rash jumped on her. <laughs> See, I, I'm, I'm opening my heart to you. Look, am I the only one who thinks like this? I have you. <laughs> you hate me. If you hate me, guess what? I have you. I forgive you. <laughs> and some of you, that's going to be a breakthrough tonight. Because when you do that, God is pleased. He loves them. He's their father. He'll deal with them in the way that he knows will bring change. We take care of ourselves. And we say, Lord... I've forgiven, but you know what? That was pretty nasty. So I need to heal. And that's our second point tonight. We need to give time to heal gradually and completely. Look at this. Because I don't know about you, man, but when I get dinged by people, a heart is a muscle, and a muscle tears, and it takes time for a tear to heal. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to heal, and a time to break down, a time to build up. There is time to heal. And the problem with us in life so, is we want to just power through and move on to the next person, the next relationship, the next friendship. And we, and we haven't healed in our heart. Guess what will happen? We project yesterday's hurts into future relationships. We can't tell we're injured. We're in denial, but eventually the other person will be able to tell. So what the Lord is, he's a shepherd. And this is where Psalm 23 come in. Bible likens us to sheep. Jesus is a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me. Say makes me. Yeah, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul, the seat of your mind, will, and emotions. He restores. But sometimes... He we want to move on so quickly, so God goes, you know what? I'm going to make you lie down. And that's why when we try to re-engage relationships too soon after a bad one, if God loves us, He doesn't let that work out because He wants us to take time for our hearts to heal. We forgive, then we must take time to heal completely. And we trust God. Now, most of you here are single. How many of you are single and hoping? 
How many of you don't know? <laughs> All right. Guess what? God has somebody for you. But he will make you lie down in green pastures first to heal your heart. Listen, when I was called in front of the... That was embarrassing. Okay? Because at first I thought, you know, most people, police officers will tell you, will believe the woman. And as I was sitting there, I'm, I was sweating. I was like, I think these men think I'm a pervert. Now, easy for you to sit there and yawn, okay? But what if I had a list of 13 perversions I'm bringing against you before all the leaders of the church? You're thinking, what are they thinking? Because usually the man is guilty and the woman is right. Thank God he's in control. Forgiveness freed her eventually. Forgiveness freed me, but it took me time to heal. It took me time to heal. And thank the Lord, I took time to heal. I mean, I just noticed no women in the church after that. You know why? You know what happens after a while? You start wondering. You. I wonder if you think like that. You, you smiling at me. Why are you smiling at me? Right? No worry. I'm just play acting here, okay? You got a little afraid here. All right? <laughs> I mean, really. Remember, I was only five years a Christian. I was training for the ministry. It was like you walking around going, What, sister? What I did for you? You better not accuse me. Okay, what does that mean? My heart hasn't healed. <laughs> You're too old to be in this service. Okay. <laughs> she used to be in my college group when I was like Russell, doing what Russell does. She could teach this. Okay, look, you know what I'm saying? So, would it have been good for me to go into a relationship when I'm looking around? What? What? Remember now, I also had my nightclub background where women, well, I wouldn't say threw themselves at me, but up. <laughs> That's a, yeah, that's an exact. They approached me. I was the drummer. I was the guy in the back. Okay, I wasn't one of those vain lead singers or, you know, those egotistic lead guitars. I'm partially deaf in one ear because our lead guitarist thought he was the second coming of Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> you guys know who Jimi Hendrix is? Yeah. You guys too young to know who Jimi Hendrix is. <laughs> yeah, you I know <laughs> who Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> okay. So what I'm saying is the heart needs to heal. And when the heart was right, Faye found me. God found her for me. We, she drew us together. Cindy used to babysit for us. It's 37 years. But if I had, if God didn't hold me back earlier, it could have been very bad. And God wants the best for you. So you, you forgive. Then you take time to heal. Okay? And then you start you re-enter, you trust. All relationships are based on trust, but you trust slowly and you trust carefully. Forgiveness is immediate to keep you healthy and put them in the hands of God. But you trust carefully and slowly. Forgiveness is unconditional to keep us healthy and our relationship with God right. Trust is earned. Now watch this. This woman who made the accusation, I've forgiven her, okay? And there's cordiality if we see ourselves, but listen, after that, the hurt was so deep, I ain't going to be hanging with her. I'm not obligated to be her friend. I wouldn't even work on a project with her if she were in our church. Does that mean I hate her and I haven't forgiven her? No. It just means my heart still hasn't healed in that area and I don't trust her. Now, I'm making that... You know what I'm saying? Because some people get trust and forgiveness mixed up. You say, well, I forgive. I don't want to forgive them because if I forgive them, I've got to be their friend. No, you don't have to be their friend. There's people that have wronged me over the years because I'm a public figure, okay? And I've forgiven them and we're cordial, but I will never trust them. And some of them want to be hanging around me because I'm the senior pastor. And I'm like, get away from me. It's not that I don't like you. It's not that I'm forgiven you. I don't trust you. You're all going to have people like that. You're going to have people. You're going to have people that they want to like. They want to be like Russell. He's popular. Look at his pants. Okay, get this. Somebody, get up here, okay? <laughs> I mean, I get the book of jeans, but this is extreme. 
But some people, they might think, look at his body. Oh. My God. Look at his pants. Look, he's so cool. He's so eloquent. Look at that hair. I had somebody tell me that today. Hey, they, they were so impressed with your, just the way you welcome people in the 915 service. And just out of charisma, but if I know Russell's wise, he's, he's going to go, well, why do you want to be around me? We've had conflicts in the past. I don't trust you yet. And, and he's had real life situations like this. Because I don't sense there has been fruit and evidence of sustained change. And I know you want to be friends again, or you want to work closely with me again, but I can't trust you. I've forgiven you, but I can't trust you because not enough time has gone by that I feel like it would be worth the risk. Would that be true? Yeah. All of us go through that. You've gone through that. Thanks, Russ. I promise not to call you up again tonight. <laughs> I think. So some of you, you've been held in bondage because you feel like, I've so, got to trust them. No. Forgiveness and trust are two different things. You trust very carefully. And sometimes, guess what? You will never be able to trust them again because never change. That's okay. Just make sure you've forgiven them. And some relationships have to end. There's people I've had close relationships that's painful with before. And because too many lines have been passed, we will never be close again. I don't hate them, but I cannot have them around me in my inner circle. Does that make sense to you? And you don't feel guilty about that at all. That's usually the exception, but some people I trust this much. Some people I trust this much. Some people I trust this much. And some people I don't trust anymore. It's past the point of no return. Now, Scripture teaches this. Does that, does, that, does that make you feel guilty? It shouldn't. Just make sure you don't live in unforgiveness because that will wreck your soul and open, like for this woman, your heart to the demonic. And Jesus teaches that. We forgive for ourselves to keep ourselves healthy. Now, but if trust is possible, then, and we'll close with this, you can reconcile you can come back completely together. Our pastor in Las Vegas, Greg Bolasan, and his wife, Leah, you talk about, I mean, there was affairs, there was drug use, there was cancer, we had live bullets being fired. Okay? And they reconciled completely. They have a wonderful marriage, their kids are fine, and they pass their grace Las Vegas. That's a journey of years. Those things happen by the grace of God when people take Scripture and say, God, by your Spirit and grace, help me to live this, to make the choice necessary. And there's beautiful stories like that in our church. But it starts with forgiveness. Trust is earned, and when trust is earned, you can, and your heart has healed, you can reconcile. Um, Anthony Holyfield, you heard Michelle leaving, leading worship here. Anthony Holyfield, the big Amer African-American dude, is over all of our worship and music. And Anthony and I met in 1987. He, got, he received the Lord. I just happened to be speaking like this in a night service. And he walked in and he, he, got, he got saved. He received the Lord. And I found out that night he was playing for the Super Bowl champion, San Francisco 49ers. We have a picture of him right here. And I'm saying this because we're going to show you a clip. That's Anthony in a 49er training camp number 66. Uh, he was skinnier back then, all right? And we have another shot. That's Anthony, number 66, in the middle there. This is, this is the years of Joe Montana, Jerry Rice, Roger Craig, everybody, Charles Haley, the whole deal. This was, this was the four-time champion, Super Bowl champion 49ers. He walks in, and the journey of Anthony, I found out, he had a girlfriend named Nabuka. The reason I'm telling you this is Anthony was only two to three years older than you are when he had a big relational blow up. And he walked away from the National Football League. San Francisco was going to trade him to the Miami Dolphins, coached by Don Shula, who had just played the 49ers in a Super Bowl and lost two years earlier. They wanted Anthony, but Anthony realized what was more important than money was Nobuko. He already had two sons out of wedlock, and he realized, I've got a choice to make. And when he gave his heart to Jesus that night, God gave him the grace to start making some choices. He wanted Nobuko back. 
But Nobuko had conditions before she would trust him. With that background, I turn your attention to the video and we'll show you the interview from the morning service. Watch this. I, I want to say with these two, they're here because they're a miracle. They really are a miracle. If you want to look at the relationship that most people said would never have worked after all the hell they've been through, there they are. Just visually, as we said two weeks ago, nobody would have picked an African-American from the deep south in Alabama to marry a Japanese national from Tokyo, Japan. They are the only ones on the planet, I believe, <laughs> that fall into that category. But then God is the God of the unusual and the amazing if we put God in the center of the relationship. I'm going to summarize things, okay, because this is going to be shown at Cityside. Cityside people, wave at the Cityside people. This is going to be on video at the Cityside people. <laughs> See, you always want to be on television. And so Tony's got to be here to cover the, the music team here, so, but we're going to put Nabucco in a cart and bring you. See, she's right. That's why you see her. Um, we know the story because from two weeks ago, we know the National Football League, football had been your life. You played for the Super Bowl champion 49ers. Bill Walsh and George Seifert traded you to the Don Shula and the Miami Dolphins. Uh, another, they had been in the Super Bowl and collided two years prior. So you weren't going to like Cleveland. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but along the way, um, you lost trust in yourself because of drugs. I mean, let's face it. Everybody was doing it back then. The tests weren't as strict. But it had affected your relationship. By now, you had a family. You weren't married yet. But there was tension and separation. The fact you are together today means you had to walk the journey. Forgiveness? Right, Nabucco? Yes. yes. Healing, trust, but then reconciliation. Here's what we know. The basis of all relationships is trust. It's the foundation. There were some things that Tony had to traverse in order for you to trust him. Yes. What were they? Well, one is we were relocating from San Francisco because we both agreed that it's not a good place to raise children, start all over again. So I came back to Hawaii first, and for him to relocate back to Hawaii, that's the first thing that will help me to start trusting him again. Okay, and that's huge. So you had to actually change your location, where you live, your world. I mean... 49ers, your mother lived there. Um, I mean, so and you grew up there in your latter years before Dick Tomey recruited you to your right. age. Right. Okay, and so that's one. That's huge. Yes. What else? The secondly, because we were moving towards doing things right, so we had to, in order for us to get married, we have to go to premarital counseling, even though we had two kids already. So then, so you snuck church in there at that point. Yeah. <laughs> So we took a class, um, was taught by Pastor Sid Sumida, and one of the key points that he had to do was to write a letter of apology to my dad because okay. we were not doing things correctly. So that's the third thing. Big Tony has to write a letter of apology to your father in Japan. Yes. Okay. What's the fourth thing? She got a list, man. <laughs> <laughs> I had to. I had to put it in order. <laughs> And then uh, for him to, this is kind of put together, make sure he's free from dr drugs and start attending church. That's a load. Now, did she tell you all that up front, man? That's like... Just finding out about that list. Uh, <clears throat> no, I, uh, not, not in so many words. Um, and, and it wasn't presented to me as a list. The funny thing about it was while she was here praying for me, I was still in San Francisco tying up things with the NFL and everything. And uh, on, on my, in my worst state, drug addicted and, and everything, I have a falling out with my father, my natural father. And um, he was supposed to help me get here. He, he, he reneges on it, on the deal. So now I have no way to get here and to, and to reconcile with Nabucco. And so 
this letter that I, did, I just find it out that Pastor Sid told, told her to tell me to write the letter. But the letter to her uh, father-in-law, who, by the way, they, they didn't want to have anything to do with us for, for good reason because I had basically kidnapped their daughter for seven years. Mm. And when I wrote the letter to him, that started the, uh, uh, the journey of reconciliation. Would you, for you, along the way, you came to the Lord? Yes. I'm looking at this guy, and I know him very well. Not as well as you, but pretty well. Close. This is a mountain of a man that will not be moved very easily. <laughs> what do you think made the difference? I used to pray and talk to God and shower and cry a lot. Because my prayer was to God, please change him. Because I thought I was doing good. I was still newly saved. I got saved in 87. He came, and towards the end of 87, we got married in 88. But I didn't hear anything from God. Nothing changed. I prayed. And in the shower again, in a quiet moment, I asked him, are you telling me that I need to change? And that was a confirmation. So I think God was, because I'm not perfect, God has to take everybody through change, and I have to change first. And like Pastor Norma said, God would take care of him. He will change him. I couldn't change him. Only God can change him. Would you have married him if he refused to move from San Francisco? I had to wait for God to mm -hmm. give me that confirmation. You kind of, now with the Lord in the picture, it was different. That yes. was a game changer. But you know, just saying, just support, would you have married him if he stayed on drugs? Well, his mom told me, even though we were not to get back together, make sure to keep the relationship open for our children's sake, mm -hmm. because we have two at mm -hmm. the time. He kept the older one in San Fran. I came home with mm -hmm. the second one to um, Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So I would have probably maintained that relationship till God made a way. Mm -hmm. What would have been the deal breaker in trust? I think it would have taken me to a new level of trust, trusting him. No, what would, would have been it. the deal breaker? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. In other words, where would you have said, I'm not going to trust you. In any of these five areas, where would you have broken it off, knowing that you couldn't trust him? Would it have been the drugs, not moving? Probably not moving. Wow. So that... That's the first part. That's probably what brought you to God. Yes. Because you knew you couldn't bring that. Yeah. You know what's amazing is that the drug deliverance was a miracle. Yes. I know, let me just say this. We know as leaders, and Tony helps in the ministry in this area, the hard thing to do is to get people off of drugs. Drugs ruins most relationships and marriages. It's the hidden evil. And um, you didn't, Let's recap this. You didn't trust yourself because trust has to be... If we don't trust ourselves, what are we doing getting into another relationship? We're being... Because we have emotional needs, right? We're in denial. I mean, it, because it was God, but you realize that those five things, that's, that's a massive amount of commitment. Yeah, I, I, you know God is at work when he's telling me the same thing he's telling her in a different way. He, he's causing uh, tensions to happen for us to make decisions in all of our lives. I believe God starts to orchestrate things and the tensions come where we have to make a decision and, and he leaves that decision to us. And in, the, in this particular instant, instance as our lives have unfolded and, and now we're at 20 we just celebrate our 29th year anniversary I think that looking back you see God's hand at work you don't see it sometimes in the moment but we see God's hand working where he's telling her the same thing he's telling me but in a different way and he's causing life's pressures to come upon us in such a way that we we either go to him or, or we don't. And um, 
I knew that I needed to make a decision to get here because where I was wasn't going to stop. It wasn't, I didn't have the character to make life changes on my own. And it's funny, one day uh, my cousin handed me a photograph. She said, hey, hey, they call me aunt sometimes. You know, my, you know what my aunt my calls me, but he goes, aunt, this must be yours. And he hands me a photo and it's just Nabucco standing in a hallway. Mm. And for some reason, I just went, what am I doing? And I got up and I said, I gotta go. And that's what started this whole journey of just, my mission changed from, it, from the NFL and trying to you know, go to the next team to how to reconcile my family, how to get my family back together, how to do that. And I knew that if I stayed where I was, that wasn't gonna happen. All the so. while you're praying. We call it praying in the shower. It was a scripture that means a lot to you. Yes. What is that scripture? My best friend who's um, led me to salvation prayer, when she gave me the um, Bible, she put her favorite scripture, which became my favorite scripture, which is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord in all your heart. Lean on only your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Because I was walking crooked path, but he made that straight. And he made Tony straight. Yes. And now this week, you're going to go to San Francisco. Uh, your youngest son, Marcus, is graduating uh, from the police academy training. And he'll be a full-fledged police officer in the city of San Francisco. Things come full circle. In the city you left where you played for Bill Walsh and George Seifert, your son is going to be enforcing the law and maybe tracking down people like you. <laughs> Only God Absolutely. can do that. You know, uh, it'd be great if we... Do you, you have a picture of him that we could show in the next upcoming yeah, services yeah, in? Is yeah. like in a sexy uniform yeah, and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, good. Sorry, guys. Yeah, we couldn't get that ready for you because he's really buff. Played for Coach Jones uh, at SMU and then actually played basketball at SMU at the same time for the great legend Larry Brown who wanted him to play even the following year, but... He heard the Lord and needed to move on. How about a hand for Anthony and Nabucco? So we're going to bring it down to a close here. You have to turn back the clock. We all look old now, but when that time was, I was 30, and they were about 25. And so they were young adults, just about your age, if not just a couple years older, when those miracles happen. How many of you know Marcus? Marcus played music here, yeah? So Marcus is up there now. And, and, and listen, you have a chance to lay a platform for greatness. All of life is relationships. But the turnaround came through Jesus. It wasn't through self-help techniques. It came through the Lord. The Lord designs us for relationship. And He makes us... He, he empowers us through Scripture and by the leading of His Spirit to have relationships that last. I didn't read in a book. I've been married 37 years. I've had only one girlfriend all my life. I've really only kissed one girl. Naomi was at that point when Anthony, no, when I started ministering to Anthony Nabucco, Naomi was maybe three years old. And now years later, we're still great friends. And Anthony covers all of the music in our church. How about that for a story? Let me tell you, when I first met Anthony, I went, oh, man. Jesus, this is going to take one big miracle. But you know, if you do it God's way and you let him in, great things happen. Two things I'll leave you with tonight, and then I'll turn it over to Russell. First of all, understand, again, God forgives us unconditionally, no matter what. We have, in our church, we have ex-murderers. Not current murderers. We have cons, uh, police. The officers come here, like police uh, officer back there. They come in and they look at our church because you know you got to go through like a dozen services. They go, I know these guys. <laughs> Isn't that what the church does? It brings forgiveness and redemption. Right? My son-in-law's father spent time in prison, Billy Lyle. 
I mean, by the way, Pastor Billy spoke in the previous service. He's, his grace group, he's the only one who hasn't been to prison. He leads a group with the only. So he said, uh, does my father count? <laughs> God is the God of all forgiveness. But guess what? Once we come to him, he then trusts us with his blessing according to our obedience. So trust given and his blessing that's given is not automatic. That he trusts us only with as much blessing and provision as, as he can trust us with. It's like if you're a parent, you're not going to just give you know, everything carte blanche to your kids. There's a sense of responsibility that's demonstrated and earned. Forgiveness, God loves us. He forgives us all equally, loves us equally, but he rewards us based on our obedience. Forgiveness and trust, related but two different things. I leave you with this. If you haven't yet committed your life to Jesus, if you haven't, com haven't yet committed all of your relationships to Jesus, remember the greatest commandment in all of Scripture is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. All of the law of God is wrapped up in commandment number two. Love your neighbor as yourself. Imagine that. The Bible is really simple. It comes down to loving God and loving others. The one thing, and I'll close with this, that will prevent the blessing of God from flowing in your life is if you don't forgive people. You don't have to trust them. Trust is a process. But just as Jesus forgave us and we receive his forgiveness, he says, we must, and that's where we started tonight, you must forgive those that have offended you and violated you. In this church, we've talked to people whose children have been molested. They've been abused. There is the most heinous things that have happened to the people in our church, and we've seen Jesus bring a gracious spirit of forgiveness, a wonderful tomorrow. Don't hold on. Let go and let God, by the gospel, work amazing things. Pastor Russ, would you come on up here?